You know, you, you know, to be free from whatever holds you, whatever fear may hold you, whatever anger may hold you, whatever desire may hold you, and, 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 and to be free from the system. Not only to be free on the outside, but as Vinnie's song this morning as we sang it, to be free on the inside, see? Free from all the things that keep you from doing what spiritually you know that you should do. Hey, Tom, good to see you, man. It was all the way from Trenton. I'll tell you about Trenton. <laughs> <laughs> to be free is the essence of why we're here this morning. Because I want not only you to be free, but to be free, to make the animals free, to make the children free, to make the teenagers free, to free people from the bondages of all of the hurts and the wars and the violence. But you see, what happens here is exactly what I've just recently are, am going through and what each one of you have gone through. We always eliminate today and we bring in tomorrow. Always today disappears and our eyes become clouded by tomorrow. And that's the problem. And I'm not here to tell you that if you do some magic thing that I tell you to do, everything's going to work out. But I am here to tell you that if you'll practice this meditation, when the situation arises, you'll have stored up within yourself that which will take you across and beyond the problem that's about to come against you or assault you. This Bhagavan says something, something bad happens with tomorrow, and I like the way he puts it. He says, when we bring in tomorrow, when we bring in tomorrow, we then have to carry the load of yesterday. When we bring in tomorrow, we then have to carry the load of yesterday because tomorrow can only be there if yesterday's go on nourishing it. In other words, everything that you're sitting here right now concerning yourself about tomorrow is because of what happened yesterday. This is what happened to me yesterday and it's going to cause this to happen to me tomorrow. And if you look and if you're, if you're honest with, your, with yourself and if you're honest with the, with the way that you think, you'll find out that there is not one iota inside of your mind of today. Everything is what happened and what's going to happen. And I know that I've been living through this. Everything, even no matter how wonderful today is, my mind would not stop telling me, what are you going to do tomorrow? What's going to happen? You have to go to Trenton. You have to do this. You have to do that. And what's going to be the reaction? And if you sit here today, sitting here, you have today, which is Sunday, but then what's going to happen tomorrow? What's going to happen Tuesday? What's going to happen next week? What's going to happen in the encounter that you have coming up? And you know, there's no way to stop it. There are simplistic teachers today. There are Christian teachers. There are New Age teachers. And they'll say, oh, well, if you do this and if you do that, this. And if you do this and do that, your mind is still going to raise hell with you. And so you can't stop it. You cannot stop the mind from causing you to worry. You can't do it. But what you can do is make yourself strong so that when the conflict arises, you are a match for the mind. The mind is not going to overwhelm you. Jesus Christ put it this way in Matthew 6.34. Look what he said. Go to page 782. And Jesus Christ in Matthew 6 said this. Take no thought for tomorrow, for tomorrow shall take thought for the things of itself. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. One day at a time. Take no thought. He wasn't saying don't worry. He was saying, take no thought. Nothing can stop you from worrying. Nothing can stop me from worrying. I can go to the greatest. The only thing they can give me is pills to knock me cold. Otherwise, I'm going to worry. <laughs> but you see, the difference is now I've got the meditation. I've got that account built up in that bank deep within myself so that when I come up against this thing, I'm a match for it. It's no longer just going to destroy me. Now I get stuff that comes from the right hemisphere that says, this is what you do. This is how you react. This is what you're going to do. Yes, you're going to do this. Yes, you're going to do that. And things then start to fall into place. I'll tell you something. If you want to know, when you're going through a crisis like I've been going through, and then all of a sudden nature says, you're not going to be able to deal with this by yourself because you'll have a breakdown. So what I'll do, I'll have an airplane with the engine running. And as soon as you walk out, jump off and we'll take you to Florida. Say so you want to say it's a call. Oh, well, that's a coincidence. That's no coincidence. That's what happens. There is an intelligence behind all of this stuff. Nature is not unintelligent. 
Little dogs know how to give birth to babies and do all that they have to do. Birds know where to go. Ducks know where to go. Snakes know what to do. Everything knows what to do because there's an intelligence. And if you will allow it, there is an intelligence that will feed from that ninth consciousness. And when you get into a situation of a confrontation, it will carry you all the way through it. The confrontation will come. You'll sweat the confrontation, but there's a certain something deep within inside of yourself that says, I'm going to get through this thing. I'm going to get through this thing. It's going to work out. It's got to come out right. It has to come out right because Jesus said it would. Buddha said it would. Krishna said it would. There is something within me that's going to make this come out right. And that's the beautiful part. Is it impossible to worry? I say it is absolutely impossible not to worry. It is impossible not to worry. That's what I'm saying. Oh, you're going to have a new job. We're changing your job, but don't worry. <laughs> oh, yeah. I'm very positive. Oh, yeah, I'm, I'm gonna t I'm, I've, I've got to approach this thing with a positive outlook. And you do. You approach it with a very positive outlook. Everything is going to be all fine. And when you sit down by yourself, there's a little man inside. He says, you're screwed up. Everything is not going to be fine. <laughs> I'm going to tell you all of the things that are going to go wrong. <laughs> and so then I come and I, and I, how are you? You're feeling positive? <sighs> and you're telling everybody on the outside that you're feeling positive, but that little man inside of your head is saying, this is what's going to happen. <laughs> and only you can hear the little man in there. Nobody else. And they'll say, and you'll go to all of these people and these new age people say, oh, well, if you just say this, everything will fly away. And so you do it. And you go home and gadosh, gadosh, and all of this stuff. And after you go on meditating and gadosh and all of this stuff, the little man comes back and says, ah, this is what's gonna, really going to happen. <laughs> and I got through it all. But see, the point is this. The point is, even though the little man is in there, there is another man, the Christ man within you, who makes this thing happen. And when he, it's just like boxing. You see, I was getting ready for a big fight. The meditation now was, I didn't know that I had been trained in the higher consciousness, doing a little footwork. I didn't know how to do the footwork. <laughs> Built up my own. I didn't know that I had all this stuff. So when all this crap started, I pow, 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 pow. And there it was, all the power to get me through this. That's what meditation does. Most people don't have that, see? So when the big guy comes, pow, you're on the floor, and you're taking Valium. Because you didn't know that there was a big man inside of you who will carry you. So understand that in meditation, it's not going to prevent the struggles from coming against you. It's going to put you in shape that when you need to draw on that power, you'll have it so that you can get through those things. Yes. You have to stand up. You have to back me. Just compare uh, yourself to when uh, they came down and told you that you were being transferred when you were selected risk up to Trenton and what yes. happened then. I was a complete basket case. I was a complete basket case. I went nuts. Put my fist through walls, kicked the uh, cabinets, did all of these things. I mean, really. And, uh, but see, went into a very serious depression. But now... Even though I wanted to go into a depression, the Christ man inside of me said, this is what we're going to do. Today we're going to say goodbye. Then when you walk out, there's going to be a car. We're going to go in an airplane. You know, what do you, here's a guy, doesn't have a job. I mean, I have a job, but I didn't know where my job was. Didn't know where the heck Trenton was. My whole life had been changed after 20 years, and I'm sitting in this big plane, and the lady said, what do you want to drink? <laughs> I'll have... Sprite. <laughs> well, this would be nice. Shall we fly? <laughs> Boom, off we go. Here I'm flying 36,000 feet. I don't have a job anymore. It's not that. <laughs> What's who cares? See, that's the man. That's the big man inside. Land, and there's this condo waiting for us. The place I got to go is next door, and I'm unemployed, so to speak, after 20 years, and I'm bouncing in the ocean, taking a dip <laughs> in the waves. Who cares? <laughs> Look out for the sharks, they're dolphins. Who cares what the hell? <laughs> right. I can see the negative ions just floating away. <laughs> and you know, and it's a funny, it's a, it's a funny, it's a funny thing. It's a funny thing what the spirit does when you're ready. There's a guy named Mike Doyle who's in our company. 
And something drew him. He's a big executive who has charge of the California coast and the Midwest coast. And here I was, you know, walking into that thing. You feel kind of funny. You're not the big shot kind of like you used to be, you know. And the Mike Doyle, every meeting that we had, this guy came and sat next to me. And everybody's eyes were bigger than bullets. All right, what are you doing, rubbing elbows? You know, it's it just what I needed. Because there's an ego. You've got to feed the ego a little bit. You know, you don't want everybody there. Yeah. <laughs> and so everything seemed to work its way out. And then this thing, this chaos happened. I've got to go to Trenton. Tom LaPrestri, who lives in Trenton, I've got to go to Trenton. And I get in a car and drive up Lacey Road, and the bridge is out. <laughs> <laughs> so the past and the future constitute our whole mind, isn't that true? Is just look at, your, look at your mind right now, wherever you're sitting in this room, look at your mind right now. And if you've been true to yourself, you'll find out that you'll not find one iota of the present. So how do you live in the present? Where do you find the present? Jesus Christ says in Matthew 6, 25 to 33, take no thought. And then Jesus Christ says in Matthew 6, 6, when you pray, wake up Elizabeth, when you pray, <laughs> enter the closet and close the door. That means get inside of yourself. There is no preacher. There is no teacher. There is no church. There is nobody outside. There is a magnificent, beautiful power that is the power that the animals understand, the stars understand, nature understands it is within you, and it will do to you, and it will do for you what I know it's doing for me right now. It will flex its muscles, and everything that seems like it's going to destroy you will be pushed aside. Not by your might, not by your power, but by my spirit, says the Lord who dwells inside of you. And doggone it, it works. It works. It really works. When the past no more overpowers you, when the future no more possesses you, when you disconnect from the memories past and the imaginations of the future, then say, who are you? Who are you? In that moment, you are this. You are no body. Not nobody. No body. And you know what? No one can hurt you when you are no body. That's when the good things start to happen. You know why? Because you, you, know what the, you know what happened? And each one of us, each one of you sitting here, whether you're in the last row, the second row, over here, do you know what happened? You have an ego inside of you. I have an ego inside of me. And the ego seeks wounds. The ego exists through wounds. The ego depends on misery and pain. And each one of us experience that. But when there is no body, there is silence, there is stillness, there is no noise. And this is the beautiful part. That stillness, that silence is sacred. The only thing that exists in this universe that is sacred is that stillness, that silence, that kingdom that Jesus Christ said is within you. And it's totally under your control. It does not lie in the prevalence of any new age or old age or church or religion or Christianity or Buddhism. It lies deep within yourself. And you don't have to justify yourself to me or anybody else. It doesn't cost you any money to go there. But as you enter within yourself into that holy, silent temple, then you find this thing which stores up the energy for these types of confrontations and gives you the power to run through them. My God, it does work. And in a beautiful way. Let me show you what I'm talking about. If you have a Bible in somewhere in your hand, I want you to, to open it to page 759. Okay? Page 759. Look at 759 and see what's a strange guy by the name of Habakkuk. And in chapter 2, verse 20, this is what he says. But the Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth keep silence before him. Not praying, not singing amazing grace, what a wretch you are. Not singing, I got the joy, 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 da -da my soul, da -da my soul, but keeping silence before him. You know. <laughs> Being silent. Like the, like the song said this morning, silent sunset. The silence of a, of a gull. You know, one of the most beautiful things, we were in the ocean and Joan and I looked up and there in absolute silence were these pelicans just gliding in silence and love and in harmony with one another. And, 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 and that's, that's, this is what life is. The silence of the dolphins, the silence, each thing carrying out its, 
and, and the destruction of our, of our, you and me, the destroyers, to destroy the animals, to destroy the earth, to destroy the fish, and to destroy all of the things that God has created. But now we, we come to the holy temple. And remember, there is only one temple that is not built with human hands that God dwells in, and it's right here at the sides of your head. It's the only temple where you'll find that which you call God. It's right there at the sides of your head. And for the first time, that's when you become aware of the eternal celebration that goes on and on and on, the unbroken circle that never ends. This is what Buddha said. Buddha said, when you look within with no mind, it's all light. When you look within with no mind, it's all light. And what happens when you look within? When you come on Tuesday night or whenever you come and you look within yourself, wherever you may be in meditation, you look deep into the darkness of your own soul. You look deep into the darkness of your own mind. And Buddha says, when you look into that darkness, you see light. And Jesus Christ says, when you stimulate the pineal gland, when the eye be single, your body will fill with light. And you say, well, I sit in darkness in meditation. How can this be light? Look, go to page 747 in those little Bibles, okay? Page 747. <clears throat> and let me share something with you. Amos. You know, there is no time that I, that I open this particular book in the Bible that the other name doesn't pop right into my mind. Andy. I hear it instantly. Andy. How's your son? Yeah, hey. Yeah, that's it, all right, Amos. You know, it's just, it is a funny the way your mind is. It doesn't ask for your permission to do stupid. Here I am in front of people. We're talking about serious stuff. This is church Sunday morning. I am, let's go to the book of Amos. And the first thing I think is Andy. <laughs> J.C. Calhoun, you know, how you doing there, son? Isn't that, but see, that's the way your mind is. It doesn't say, uh, do you mind if I think of this now? It's a, <laughs> I'm talking the book of Amos and Andy. Yeah. All right. I seize it. Yeah. Is that stupid? But do you know what I'm saying to you? And, and you know the funny thing is everybody's sitting in this thing. When I said Amos, the first thing you thought of was Andy. And you know doggone well it did. And you're all sitting here very holy. What's wrong with Elizabeth? Elizabeth, you're gonna, I'm going to bring you up. Well, you're too young to think of Amos and Andy. Us old timers know about Amos and Andy. You know one of the funny, one of the, did you ever see? I have, uh, the, did you ever see the classic Amos and Andy shows on TV? I mean the real classic. I, the one show that I have on videotape is they, they had this diner and they cleaned up this diner because all the buses went by there and they had opening day. Well, here we is, Amos. We have opening day at our new diner and we're going to have a lot of people in here for breakfast and lunch. So you'll better get everything ready. And nobody comes in. And they look at, and here the State Highway Commission had put up a detour and they come down and <laughs> like that, right? Fancy thing. It was really fun. And then the kingfish would say, oh, woe is me, son, woe is me. What am I going to do? Okay, but this is what I wanted to show you. When you go into meditation, you go into the darkness of the mind, deep within the darkness of the mind. And there Buddha says, when you look into that darkness of the mind, there is light. Now look at Amos chapter 5, all right, where I, I showed you to go on page whatever it was. I said 747. Amos chapter 5, and look at verse 18. Woe unto you that desire the day of the Lord. To what end is it for you? The day of the Lord is darkness and not light. Uh-huh. Look at that. And then go to verse 20. Shall not the day of the Lord be darkness and not light, even very dark, and no brightness in it? So when the guy's saying, I saw the light, I saw the light, he probably had indigestion because he was looking at the wrong thing. Look deep into yourself to the darkness and to the stillness because in that darkness and stillness is the center, is yourself, is the light. If you can only put your mind aside, you become aware of the cosmic play and you become aware of your part in it and then you become aware of energy, energy that always is, energy that never ceases, never stops. And this is when we come into this beautiful age of Aquarius and you rise into this higher mind and it was Jesus Christ who prophesied it. It was Jesus Christ who said, hey, when you see the man with the pitcher of water enter into the house and go to the upper room, he said when the time of Aquarius comes, raise into the higher realms of consciousness and you'll be able to play in this act. But there's another possibility, you know, and that's a possibility that affected me too. You can become conscious of the light or you can become conscious of the self. 
You fall. You're, you're confined. You, you live in a prison, in a cell. The Bhagavan says you live in a sealed cave of your own mind, and I've been there, and each one of you have been there. Into that deep, secret, sealed cave where God is your enemy. And the mind is your shelter. In Romans 8, 7, the Apostle Paul says the carnal mind is enmity against God. When you are in consciousness above the mind, remember something. You have no body. You have no name. You have no form. You're not man nor woman. You have no religion. All the things that isolate you, women have been degraded by the Bible, by religion. Women have had to struggle and fight and, and do whatever they could to simply gain a degree of respect and equality. Why? Because they have been butchered by the religions of the world. And now you get to a point where you rise above that. As <laughs> soon as you're born, what happens? You're in your mother's womb. You're a beautiful child. You're a little baby. Nobody knows, but everybody loves little babies about to be born. But as soon as you're born, they put a name on you. And you're a Jew, or you're an Italian, you're Spanish, you're Puerto Rican, whatever you are. All of a sudden, millions of people hate you. You didn't even get a chance to spit yet. You're going, ah, everybody hates you because you're a Jew, you're Italian, you're black, ah, because they put a label on you. What is the kid's name? Here, yeah, the kid's name may be Schwartz. Oh, yeah, another one. He didn't do nothing. He don't know nothing. But everybody doesn't like him because he's a little Jewish kid. Little black kid comes out. God, the world's overrun. What are you get out of this? See, somebody sticks a label on you. No more. In meditation, there is no black. There's no one. There's nothing. This beautiful nature comes alive in you. Into a silence, out of a silence. And this is what I learned. And this is the this 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 is the uh, this is the scripture I wanted to share with you because it's very meaningful to me now. It's very meaningful to you in your life. And this is something that a human being has very hard time doing because you want to swing out. I mean, you know, do you know what I was doing? This new manager that's taken over my job. Do you know my mind was creating scenarios where his car would overturn on the highway? <laughs> What is this? He can have kids and everything. I don't want this. But you know what I went to? We have a psychologist at our job. And his name is Rich Petrino. I said, hey, Rich, my mind is thinking these horrible things. And I don't want this to happen. He says, Bill, let me tell you something. You're the first one to talk to me that's normal. <laughs> He says, everybody really feels that way. He says, the ones I'm worried about are the other people here who are saying, everything is all right. I got the joy, 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 joy. And it's, they're, in, they're for cock, though, already with this inside. Because your mind doesn't ask for your permission to think the car is going to overtake. It doesn't just bang, it's there. But recognizing it and understanding what's going on within yourself is the salvation. But this is what I want to show you. Go to page 59, and I'll get you out of here in a few minutes. Page 59. We're having a good time this morning, right? Fourth of July. We're in a little explosion up here. Jeez. We'll have fun going out there. And tonight, if you're around, I'm doing my sign. So that would be interesting. But I know you'll all be barbecuing. Huh? Cancer. OK. Exodus, now what, this is what I want to show you. Now watch this very carefully. This is meditation. This is what meditation does for you. Are you ready for this? No matter what your particular problem is, this is what meditation does to you. Go to Exodus chapter 14, all right? And verse 14, what does it say? The Lord shall fight for you, and you shall hold your peace. Your help is not required. When they're ready to come for you and sock it to you, there'll be a 737 waiting on the tarmac to whisk you right the heck out of here. That's what happens. It's no coincidence. This is a truth. This has come in the new age to be there for you. No matter what the struggle or the crisis is, it will, it will be there for you, and it will lift you out of it. It really will. It really will. Just that silence. When you are not, then God is. God is you. And how can the future fail if God is you when you enter into that meditation? A new power arises to carry you to what you call God, which is that higher realms of consciousness. See, don't you see, what's original sin? Wow, what a response. What's original sin? Let me tell you what it is. <laughs> but on top of this, that's what you are. I haven't been doing this for seven years, but I mean, you know, you got it. Man eats the tree of what? Knowledge. 
Huh? That's it. Yeah, I understand that, but it's knowledge. It's understanding. The good and evil part is, see that? Watch that. See that? You see that? The good and evil part is that which is the duality of the positives and negatives and lights and darknesses. Because when you enter into the lower mind, you get a lot of good ideas. But intermixed with all of those good ideas is a lot of stuff that will kill you. And very often we don't know which is which. And what we'll say is after we got done screwing something up tiles, said, Jesus, I thought it was a good idea. I didn't know this was going to happen. I never thought this was going to happen. But knowledge is the key. Because the first thing that you do when you study, the first thing that you do when you open the book is what? How will this knowledge help me? What can I do with this knowledge that I am gathering within myself? And the desires come right along with it. You can't have knowledge unless you have a desire to improve yourself. How will this knowledge hurt me? The more knowledge, the more ego. And this is the problem. It may make you smart, but it will never make you childlike. And that's the key. It will never make you innocent. See, the tree of knowledge, the tree of life is in the midst of the garden of God, which is located to the east of Eden, which means it's on the right side. And the tree of knowledge you shall not eat. In other words, what's being said there, that you must meditate above the thoughts of the mind. Knowledge comes from the mind. Spirit comes from the higher consciousness where there is no knowledge. That's where you must eat. Huh? And it says in Revelation 2, 7, to him that overcomes I will give to eat of the tree of life. It is the right hemisphere of the brain. The tree of knowledge is planted in the vineyard. How do I know it's the right hemisphere of the brain? And what I'm saying to you is you're listening to me right now with 10% of your brain. You're working and you're reading and you're studying and all the things you're doing, you're doing with 10% of your brain. What about the other 90% that you have never activated, nobody ever told you about? How do I know that we're talking about the tree of life and I say to you that it's in the vineyard of life. Where is it? Go with me, quick. Page 505, the book of Psalms. Psalm chapter 80. Look at verse 15. And the vineyard which your right hand has planted, and the branch that you made strong for yourself, <clears throat> planted by the right hand of God, which is the right hemisphere of the brain. Look at page 530 while you're right there. Look at Psalm 121 and look what it says. Psalm 121, page 530. And in Psalm 121, look at verse 5. The Lord is your keeper. The Lord is your shade upon your right hand. And then let me just show you one last one and then I'll be finished. Ecclesiastes, page 572. Page 572. Ecclesiastes chapter 10. Look at verse 2. Read it with me. Do you ever know how they do that on TV, the evangelists? But this is something that they should read and they should learn to understand. A wise, verse, a wise man's heart is at his right hand, but a fool's heart is at his left. Huh? How do I know? The Bible told me so. Yes, sir? So, as we sum up and we finish, Bhagavan says, knowledge is all right, but not for God. In other words, I don't care how intelligent you are. I don't care how much studying you've done. I don't care how many books you've read. I don't care how many Bibles you've read. All of that knowledge is fine for the other guy, but it doesn't count with God. It's off limits with God. Because the only place God dwells in this universe is at a place where there is no human thought. It's all divine thought, so knowledge ceases to exist. See, in other words, what, you, what is this? You are taught the names of flowers. Oh, there's roses, and there's dahlias, and there's gladiolas, and there's all of these kinds of flowers. But you know what? You're never taught to dance with the flower. You're never taught to be with the flower. And I know of, I know of, right, to stop and, but to be. And what do you have to do? You have a beautiful rose, and what do you have to say? Oh, it's beautiful. And then you've screwed it up, because it doesn't need any of your words. 
just to take it and commune with it. And I know of Mount McKinley, and I know of Mount Shasta, and I know of seagulls and eagles and, and, and hawks and everything, but I've never been taught to be one to commune with the mountains or to commune with the birds or the seagulls. Never been taught that. So I learn in school all of their names, but I never learned to be one with them. You know, it's a good thing. There's an Edgar Casey meditation. You want to try it sometime? You know what you want to do? Go to the beach. There's plenty of beach around here. And visualize you have no head. All you have here is a piece of metal across your shoulders. Your head is gone. Eyes wide open. And you're, you're one with everything. You are everything. Because the only thing that keeps you confined and separated from nature is your skull. Once you get outside of that, you are everything. You and the gull are one. You and the sea are one. You and the ocean are one. And when you sing that ohm, you become that drop of dew that comes hurtling down out of the sky and says, oh, I'm going to crash into the ocean, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to die. I'm not going to exist anymore. But as soon as that little drop of dew comes out of the sky, as soon as it touches the ocean, it becomes the sea. Then all of the mighty ships can float upon it. All it carves out continents, and all of these wonderful things happen. That's why religion is wrong. Religion is wrong is because they are not helping you to become free. They are keeping you controlled by the mind. They are keeping you controlled by the system. And Jesus teaches the single eye and take no thought in the right side. And Jesus Christ said in John 8, 31, if you do what I tell you, you shall know truth, and the truth shall make you free. And that's what's got to happen to you, and that's what's got to happen to this world. They've got to be free from the systems and the religions. Buddha wants you to use your mind. Krishna wants you to use your mind. Jesus wants you to use your mind, but they don't want you to be used by your mind. The master has become the slave. And I'll conclude this with a statement that Bhagwan made, which is typical Bhagwan and typical Eastern wisdom. You are unhappy. And the reason you are unhappy is because you are standing on your head. <laughs> and when you are standing on your head, how can you dance? You're crippled. You're paralyzed. Get on your feet. Lift your head upward. And when your head is lifted upward, then you can fly. Thank you very much for sharing this time with us on uh, Sunday morning. It was good to have you. Joan will come on in just a moment and tell you what the needs are, and uh, then we'll see you around the bend. Okay? Bye-bye. Thank you so much for being with us tonight. Uh, we do appreciate you, and we appreciate your support. And uh, we just want to remind you that... Um, you know, with the video network, there are so many expenses. We have the cost of the tapes and mailing, et cetera. And you know how much postage is now. So we would appreciate it if you're not a monthly supporter, if you could possibly uh, be one. And, and if this would just like be a burden for you, then please, we don't want that. Um, we, we want you to feel free that these programs are, you know, readily accessible to you. And if you can, help support it financially fine if you can't that's fine too uh, but if you do want to if you would just let us know um, you can let us know when you send your card back or you can give a call to area code 609-971-0537 and just say that you want to be part of the video network um, we also would like to remind you at this time if you could possibly mail the tape on as soon as you're done with it. Um, we just got back a tape the other day and it had been out for one whole year. So, and, and then you all get upset, you know, when you're on the route if you have to wait for your tape. So if we could just expedite it a little bit faster, that would be good. Um, <clears throat> Bill has uh, comprised a, a book, and it's called Answers, a book of biblical responses to questions concerning the teaching of Jesus Christ in the New Age. And uh, it deals with various topics of questions that you get asked, and, you know, you're sort of at a loss of, okay, what is my... What does the Bible say? How can I support this? So if you're interested in having this book, uh, if you would just send us a check for or money order for $7 stating that you would like this book, we would be most happy to get it right off to you. Uh, people in the church have been using it, and they found it to be rather helpful. And it's how to deal with born-again Christians and the different questions that they do ask you. So um, if you want one, again, just mail a check, $7 to the Christian Village Church, and we would most certainly get it off to you. 
Thank you so much for being with us tonight, and we hope you, you will consider being a, a sponsor in, with the Video Network. Welcome to the Christian Village Church. Tonight's topic is the astrological sign of cancer. And here's the big crab himself, <laughs> Bill Donahue. Uh, tell you about it. Okay, let's, let's, uh, let's do it this time and um, get on with it. We, we want to, before we enter into discussing signs and um, astrological symbols, consider the biblical evidence that we have an authority to do that. Because that's very important. Genesis 1.14 talks about the creation of the stars. It says, let them be for signs. Psalm 147.4 says that God creates these things and calls them by their names. So if they are for signs, and, and if they do have names, and these names are authored by the divine, then we should, we should try to understand just why. Uh, Job 38.31 talks about the Pleiades and Orion and says that they influence the sweet influences of the Pleiades. Job 38.32 talks about a uh, Masroth, which is the 12 signs of the zodiac. Uh, in Luke 22.10, Jesus talks about the man with the pitcher of water and heralds the prophecy of the Aquarian age that we're entering into now. In John 14.2, Jesus talks in astrological terms. And when he says, in my father's house, which is the solar zodiac, are many mansions, which is the lunar zodiac. Um, in Judges 5.20, it says that the stars fought from heaven in their, in their course against Sisera, which means that this individual was, was in a negative position as far as the, the influence of the stars and the electromagnetic fields of the stars are concerned. Um, Castor Pollux is referred to in Acts 28.11 as the sign of the ship that um, the Apostle Paul was traveling in. And since the word ship and mysticism means that which is consciousness, then we assume from that that this um, was identifying the sign that influenced the activities of the Apostle Paul, which, was, um, which would be uh, Castor Pollux, which would be Gemini. So we come then to Cancer. And this is, particular, this is a sign I was born under. And um, I don't know if anybody else in this, in this room, or I'm sure there's many out there who are watching on television who are born under this sign. But cancer is a sign of a strange word, and it's called metamorphosis. Cancer is metamorphosis. And it's a mysterious midnight sign. And there's a constant feeling in cancer. There's a constant feeling to jump to leap to a new stage of evolution. And people that share that, and I guess tonight in talking about this, I can talk more from a personal standpoint um, because I experience these things. Uh, cancer is a carrying forward force. Uh, all that is carried forward of the spirit is brought about by the spirit functioning through the sign of cancer. The biblical symbol of cancer is in Matthew 21. And Matthew 21 talks about the donkey and the colt. If you remember, that's when Jesus rode the colt into um, Jerusalem. And what is, what is shown there is that which is new is born out of that which is old, and that which is new shall carry the, you into, into the heavenly city, into the, into the new consciousness. The old ways are gone. The new ways are, are upon us. The sun reaches its highest point in cancer. And of course, we understand then, too, that the Christ brings forth the highest movement when this metamorphosis takes place in consciousness when the consciousness of the Christ leaps and, and, and takes us from the human mind to the divine mind, such as cancer. There's an interesting thing in being married to Joan, who's a Capricorn, that the, on June 24th, the sun bears the same relation to cancer as it does at Christmas time to Capricorn. And, and, and you know, uh, I, not being an astrologer and I know very little about astrology, and I'm just trying to look from biblical and spiritual perspectives about the influence of these things, but I have been told of the fact that um, a, a person born under the sign of cancer would gravitate in spiritual forces to a person uh, born under the sign of Capricorn, which has happened to us. That summer festival on June 24th is called St. John's Day. I don't know if any of you here have ever heard of that. But St. John's Day is the day, as John the Baptist was called, he called those into the water where the change would take place. And that's what, that's what occurred. Um, when we started the program tonight, uh, Rose had her shirt on, picturing the crab. And, and that's the metamorphosis. That's the change, the, the movement deep into the, into the reaches of the sea. The, the change is, is, is metamorphosis cancer. This is the change. The negative 
and positive, uh, the negative lunar and the positive solar, the transition from the, from the God Jehovah to that which is the consciousness of Christ is the sign of cancer. People who dwell and who live and have their makeup in cancer as I do, uh, the conscious change is through feeling, feelings and emotions. Cancer people reflect the emotions of feelings of those who are around them. And I know that that's very heavy with me, and I know I fear that. And here's something else for you. It's easy for cancer to respond to lunar lust. So they become victims of this and can become quite easily a victim of this. It's easy for cancer people to change into the lower astral instead of the higher divine, and life can come to ruin under these types of circumstances. It's very easy because you're drawn to the emotions, you're drawn to the feelings. Cancer is related to the moon. The moon rules the desires and the emotions, and one becomes very restless and changeable, and I can attest to that. Very restless, very changeable when under the influence of the moon and cancer, and just time to move on, time to do things that are different. And the cancer person craves for feeling, craves for emotion. There's a, there's a feeling for sensation, touching everything and everyone. For cancer rules, the sense of touch. And cancer can be found the most sordid drunks as well as the most practical mystics. Interesting, because I could have easily qualified for either side. I, I can recall in the early part of our marriage when uh, I used to drink pretty good. And, uh, or pretty bad, however you want to phrase that, until one night a book, a whole shelf of books, as I collided with the wall, a whole shelf of books fell on top of me. I mean, there was just raining books, and I went into oblivion and woke up the next day. never remembered that and didn't know why the Molly school holes were in the wall and the shelves were all over the place and books were piled up all over. I mean, they just had fell on me. And that was how many years ago? about 25 years ago, and I have not had a drink since. Uh, it became quite apparent to me that I was on the road that m others in my family had followed, and I quickly uh, assessed what had happened, and I've not picked up a drink since, and, and never will, uh, because obviously this could have been a very destructive force in my life. And so when I read this, that the cancer uh, people uh, can be found the most sordid drunks as well as the most practical mystics. And I, and I do qualify, I believe, as a mystic, and I would think the application of the mysticism that we teach through this work is certainly practical. Cancer is concerned with astral sensing. I don't know if you know too much about astral sensing, but it is the head of the psychic trinity. The psychic trinity is this. I don't know if you knew there was a psychic trinity, but the psychic trinity is cancer, Scorpio, Pisces. That's the psychic trinity. Cancer, Scorpio, and Pisces, and Cancer then uses these two to seek an outlet for sensation, for fame, for power. And those are the negative aspects of this. Cancer people are also very impressionable, aren't you? Very imaginative hypersensitive but very selective. And, and it is. It's, it's me. Very, very imaginative, very uh, sensitive, very impressionable. But the cancer personality truly becomes positive when it becomes Christ responsive. And that's, of course, I would say pretty consistent with all of the signs that we discuss in these evenings when we get together. But cancer is a storehouse, and I, I can attest to this. And is there any other people that have this sign that are sitting in this room? Think about this. Cancer is a storehouse of moods. I can say, e yes. A storehouse of moods and emotions because the insight for cancer is either very sound or very confused. And the cancer person uses feeling when he is thinking. And that's, that's, I also can attest that. And how would you, how would you, how would you say that happens to you? 
I actually, in many instances, go into an entire drama. Whenever I'm studying these things, whenever I'm thinking things, it doesn't just become a thought, it becomes a whole play, a whole drama, an opera, something goes on, and it becomes extremely sensitive, extremely dramatic inside of my head when these things come on. Because in that side of cancer, the cancer person's feelings are psychic and everything is judged in terms of emotions and feelings. It's not judged in terms of practicality. And there's nothing you can do about that. It's judged in terms of emotions. It's judged in terms of feelings. It's judged in terms of your sensitivity. And it's judged in terms of the moods. And what cancer will do, and this is very much like the crab that uh, Rose was showing on her t-shirt, what will happen with a cancer person? What will happen with a crab? What will happen with me? Is sometimes it's better to retreat back into the hole, under the rock, out of sight, and just fold your claws and wait and stew and sulk under the rock. Because cancer people are, are tend, to, tend to be fickle, changeable. But the essence of this sign, and this is something that those of you who were born, what is that, June, June, whatever, is emotion. That's the essence of it. The essence of this sign is emotion. Well, some other signs are very physical, some other signs are very practical. The essence of this sign of cancer is emotion. And you know what? If cancer cells cannot tend their own children, they will tend other children or they become deeply affected by animals. Deeply affected by animals, and then the animals take the place of the children. An outlet to share and love. Because cancer is the great mother sign, and its inner urge is to take care of whatever is in need of nurturing. It doesn't make any difference. There is. It's an inner urge. There's a, there's, there's a feeling, you know. What, what's, so, what's so amazing about this, and uh, for me to be doing this in television and talking about these things, it's almost like revealing my life. And I, I don't know how others of you sitting here feel, but it, it's so true, all of this stuff. You, you have to be born under one of these signs and hear this and then say, yes, it is. That's the way I feel. Then you should you transcend the fact that we're talking about it in a church. You transcend the fact that John Jocelyn put these words in a book, and you say, why is that? What the heck causes that? You're born at a particular time as a little baby. The electromagnetic fields that are coming down out of the galaxies at that particular time seem to put some kind of an imprint, like a stamp on you, and off you go. And you act out this part. And some guy who doesn't know you, who may live in Timbuktu, can write down the type of person that you are on the basis of what, and it's true, and it's accurate. You know. Not to predict futures, not to fortune tell or anything like that, but what I'm telling you, it's very, very true. Listen to the next one. Gas, uh, cancer people suffer from gastric troubles when they give way to excessive emotion. Tell me about it. Tell me about it. They should change the sign from cancer to Malox. Instead of Castor and Pollux, it would be Castor and Malox. <laughs> Gee, what is that? That's my whole life. You know? And it's, and, 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 and my, uh, I don't want to get too involved in discussing this, but my problems are, you. Tom, you can predict them when, the, when, when, when we change the seasons. When the seasons change, bang, this thing roars up like a lion. Is this, uh, you've been married to me for 38 years, whatever it is. 36? 34? 34 years, and you can tell when this goes nuts. Whenever the cold or whenever the hot, whenever the seasons change, bang, goes crazy. How about you? You ever have any problem like that? A lot, yeah. There you go. Yeah. See? And that's, and, and you see, it's a blueprint. This is what's so doggone sensational about this, because it's true. There is a, there is, and there's a reason for it, sir. But here's something, and I can testify to this. Let's go back. Cancer people suffer from gastric troubles when they give way to excessive emotion. Music is a healer for them. Music is a healer. And if it isn't been for you, try it. Great thing, and I, and I spent a lot of my, my life, and with Joan too, sucking down about a half a bottle of Maalox, and then go and listen to Tchaikovsky. And, da, 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 and it is. Very 
therapeutic as, as can be, you know. But you know, what I'm telling you is Jocelyn doesn't know me, doesn't know him, doesn't know Lillian or whatever, but he's writing a blueprint and say, yeah, that's the way it is. That's the way it is. That's the way I feel. Cancer can get so absorbed in the feelings of others that they often unconsciously take on the manner of speech of those that they contact. I don't know if this is so true. It could be, maybe, maybe not. I don't know. I'm not too sure. I, believe, I worked for a long time as an insurance adjuster in Lakewood where we have a very heavy Jewish community. I used to come home speaking like this. <laughs> I didn't do it for the accident. I don't know from this. I'm not signing nothing. Get out of it. You know, right. you know. and, and you, you know, I don't know if this makes, but it's true. Is that tree falling over or is that, uh, this is something that's, <sighs> Here's something else, too, that I don't know if, but I know for me, it is part of my life. Cancer is a strong ego that can tolerate no leader, no teacher. You're looking at it. I started my cancer career by walking out of every school that they put me in. And everything was fine until they started teaching and leading. I just got up and left. I'll never forget one day I was walking down the street and a cop was standing outside of school. Where are you going? I forgot my books. I'll be right back. Three months later, they were looking for me. They had everybody out looking for me. Where are you going? I'm going to the little boy's room. Right out the door. I never understood that. I, you know? Whenever I got in church, when everybody would sing, let's all get up and sing Amazing Grace, what a wretch am I. I would sit. When they all sat, I got up. <laughs> why? I said, you know, why is, uh, why is this crazy stuff? Cancer is a strong ego that can have no leader or teacher, and though apparently shy, it must be swimming in front. Hmm. Cancer natives wish to mold others, but only in the involved Christ soul in an atmosphere of freedom can this power benefit the planet. Otherwise, in the uninvolved, this force becomes detrimental because the cancer soul itself can fall victim to its own selfish insistence. You know, I want you to be here. I want you to do this. That's, I guess, why I, I've been able through meditation to, to get to a point, and probably one of the things that rubbed me so wrong with religion and Christianity was this ins incessant idea that you had to do this, you had to say this, you had to write this, you had to believe this, and, 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 I, and I knew that I, I couldn't ever and never wanted to expect that of any people. I just, and, and, and our position here is that I am only here to share things with you, period. You do as you do. You create as you create. Your beliefs, your actions are none of my business at all. But cancer people blow hot and cold, bold and bashful one moment, listless and intent the next. But the cancer must not be ruled by the moon, must be ruled by the spiritual light, which is the sun. And I can tell you of this because I've gone through this and um, it says, all cancers live in a deep hurt until they find the light of Christ. I've, I've, I've recently gone through this and experienced this again and, and, and was told that, you know, nowadays we're, we're, we're becoming familiar or acquainted with the refer refer reference to the child within, the child is hurt within. Well, it's very strong in this particular sign. You know what it says? It is just about impossible to teach a cancer person anything because of this strong psychic force that circles within them. But there is an open door. The forces of the sun and the forces of the moon must meet in meditation that we go through. The emotions must meet the Christ, and then the life will come and the hurt will disappear. The human body that we all dwell in is God's temple. The basic structure for the expression of I am that I am is prepared 
in the sign of cancer. So all beings must understand cancer, the metamorphosis, the crab, the, the change. Albert, what is it? Maybe you can, and I'm sure you can be much more um, lucid about this than I am, the metamorphosis of the crab, the, the, um, the change that it goes through. Do you, are you aware of it? The oh, well, um, it has at first a uh, soft shell. Mm -hmm. Later, it becomes a hard shell. There should be something there. Okay. I think so. Yes. The full moon affects, affects when, the crab, when the crab sheds its... And it does it many times in its life, so it's in constant metamorphosis. There's also uh, uh, the metamorphosis, it's a crustacean, what they call a crustacean type of crustacean, is it? And there is a change, but there is a real metamorphosis that occurs in this creature, a real change that occurs in this creature from one semblance to another. Say. So, in other words, why then this becomes so important? Because forgetting what sign you're born under, or what it ha it's a metamorphosis that must occur in us all. Regardless of sign, we, we must linger in the depths of the, of the deepest, darkest part of the sea, which we call consciousness, the place of God, and then allow this change to take place and then rise upward and then move out into the land as, as this, uh, this animal does. So all beings must understand that. This is cancer, the mood of metamorphosis. The mood that, that I live and have lived my life in and, and have responded to so many of the things that we've talked about here tonight, the change from the lower to the higher, the spirit's urge is always higher for a wider expansion of consciousness. Each one of us has that. I mean, it doesn't necessarily be unique with this particular sign. And, and you know, it, it doesn't necessarily mean that, you know, cancer itself, because and I'm not, as I said, I have never studied astrology. I know nothing about it. I don't read it now. I don't get involved in it. I, I just think that from a standpoint of understanding the scientific aspects of it and the spiritual aspects of it, the point is that it seems that everybody has a little bit of this and a little bit of that. Cancer may dominate your particular life, but you may have a, a little bit of this sign and a little bit of that sign and so forth and so on. However it works, I'm sure there are many of you out there that are much more uh, lucid about it than I am, but there is certainly a need for each of us to reflect a little bit when we think of these things and then go back into the Bible and hear the words of, 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 of God, if you would, saying, hey, I, I made these things for signs in the heavens, understand them, I've named these things, they influence you, the Pleiades has an influence, Orion has an influence, Cancer has an influence, and the influences each one of us that are born under the sun can testify to tonight, yes, indeed, we do have these. Yes, indeed, I do have these gastric problems. Yes, indeed, they do flare up during the change of the seasons. Yes, indeed, ever since I've been a child, I have not been able to sit under teachers or leaders. Yes, as I've grown and that, that revolutionary aspect of my heart grew stronger and stronger and stronger until the point reaches now that I am indeed a spiritual revolutionary who says that each person must be free to follow their own path and be guided and be taught by no one. And in fact, if you look in the Bible in 1 John, it says, if the spirit that dwells in you, dwells in you, you need no man to teach you, because the Spirit will teach you and lead you into all truth. And why is that? Because whatever anybody can teach you is their opinion. I give you opinions, but it not, is not necessarily true for your life. You have to find and you have to seek and you have to look and you have to be like that crab and retreat back under the deep rock and deep, God's deepest truth and be still and wait until direction comes to you. It's very, very important. Nothing, there is nothing that can be more destructive in your life than somebody to teach you. If you want to be a doctor, you have to learn. If you want to be a lawyer, you have to learn, no matter what business you want to go in. These are the things of the, of the carnal mind, but we're talking about the spirit mind. We're talking about that part where there is no teaching, where there is no thought, where there is no, 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 no knowledge. We, we're transcending these things and going beyond anything that the most intellectual person could consider today. We're talking about that. So you can't have anybody teach you about this. I think uh, when, when Shakyamuni Buddha was set upon by the Spirit, the Buddha turned and said, one thing I know for sure, this cannot be taught. But I can teach the way to it. Mm. And so that's what I do. I, can't, I, I have no idea what's going to greet you when you enter into the temple of this holy place. 
You come back and teach me. Say, this is what I have found. And then I could look for it and never find it because it's not mine. It's none of my business. See? That's why religion is so ridiculous because you got all 200, 300, 500, and they're all saying they think alike. How could this be? And yet they're all born under different signs. Of course, they don't even, they don't even acknowledge such a thing. Though the Bible speaks of it, they don't acknowledge it. Even, even, even as you turn on the, on the television, I, 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 watched, I watched today in, in, a, in a, a Christian program, a Christian television, and guess who the guest speaker was for Sunday morning? Ollie North. You know? I, I mean, after all, you can't... We're talking about the universal God who doesn't take sides with anybody, who, who embraces the world, who embraces, who embraces everyone regardless, and not American or whatever it is. And here you have somebody that with the CIA and the Iran Contra and all of this kind of stuff. This is your guest speaker in church in the pulpit. And a big American flag comes down. And what has this got to do with God? Say, so, has nothing to do with God. There are two scriptures that I, that I picked that I think that I think of the crab and as I think as it moves around and it moves up the crags and all the rocks uh, under the sea. I want you to look at page 493. Page 493. And look at the book of Psalms. The book of Psalms. Psalm 61, verse 2. And this is something that each one of you, I would hope, as you enter into your meditation and as you, and as you go into Om or whatever, you're, you have a longing, you have a purpose, see? You don't need new age earphones in order to meditate or, or eyeglasses or smoke or whatever it is. You need to bring yourself into a quiet time and to seek the face of Christ. And in that higher consciousness you say, as it says in Psalm 61, verse 2, from the end of the earth will I cry unto you, when my heart is overwhelmed, lead me to the rock that is higher than I. Lead me to the rock that is higher than I. That's what. You see, like what we talked about this morning, there's such a misunderstanding. And yet, I said to Joan in the car, I, I think one of the most magnificent things that I've, I've, I've ever studied or ever heard or ever learned in all of the years I've been doing this was a short comment from Shakyamuni Buddha that people do not understand the purpose of meditation. And meditation is not to do anything while you're meditating. Meditation is a storehouse. It builds up a reserve. It's like placing something in the bank so that it becomes available to you, need, to you not when you want it, but when you need it. Buddha said that. Buddha said that. Buddha said it is available to you when you need it. In other words, when you come up against a problem, when you come up against a storm, then this reserve will come rushing from the right hemisphere and assist you to carry you over, over the pitfalls of this. It's not to float around the room. It's not to have psychic visions and all of this kind of stuff or see colors. It is to help you through the, through the difficulties of life because the difficulties will come at you. I was talking, I was using this morning the thing about a boxer. See, if one boxer is going up against another boxer, well, he says, I can't make the other guy any weaker. You're not going to make Mike Tyson or anybody else any weaker or any dumber. Or, but what you have to do is make yourself faster. So he trains and he punches and make his arms bigger. And he may have to, why? So he can, he can, he can handle the, 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 the opposition. And this is what meditation does. Because we're all very, very weak. And when these things start to come against us, we can fall so easily. But as we meditate, we build up a storehouse within us. And then when we come into an actual conflict, this storehouse comes running out, just as if it was a boxer who had trained so beautifully and built up his weight and built up his muscles. And now he can go and he can stand toe-to-toe -to -toe with the adversary, and you will not fall. You raised your hand back there, Lorraine. Yes, what did you want to say? OK, you, well, you, uh, yeah, you have to come back because it, you, can you spend the you have to maybe get up. Look at Ethel. I'm just, let's just stand up here. Can you see her? Yeah. Okay. Joni can attest to this. Um, I went for surgery Friday, and I had four teeth pulled and stitched. And, and you know how I used to get the thought of it. And he plays on Enya or uh, one of the Enya. Medita Enya. And my concentration went right to that music. And my Nam Yoho Renge Kyo, mm -hmm. and that was over. It was over with. 
and then I went and had Belgian waffles and bacon <laughs> that same day. And mm. my, both my sides are healed up. So, I mean, so it's got to be the meditation. Certainly. It is. It's a good practical thing. And I'm sure that the meditation helped you through the, through the surgery. The Belgian waffles, I think, was your own idea, Lorraine. <laughs> but that's great. Let's look at one other scripture before we go. And this talks about, I think, the crab who, and this talks about you. You come in here, and many times, most of you who can, will sit on the floor. I always sit on the floor right here. And you, and, and, and you come and you'll sit, and, and you'll cross your legs or set your legs out or whatever, and you go into a meditation. You go deep into the center of your being to seek the face of Christ. And I like this, and I understand it now as I watch it. Go to page 850, and let's look at Luke chapter 14. Luke chapter 14, verse 10. When you are bidden, in other words, when you are called, go and sit down in the lowest room. And when he that bade you come, he may say, friend, go up higher. And you shall have worship in the presence of them that sit at the meet with you. Go up higher. Come up higher. But you first have to sit at the lowest point, And then you'll say, go up higher. I have, I have had a, been living out a meditation of, 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 of sorts. I, um, in, in the change that I had in this position, and I don't want to keep making this and, and blowing your heads with this thing with my problem, but, um, you know, I, I had this big office with this mauve carpeting, and, uh, you know, I mean, it was just hotsy-totsy and all of this stuff, and I found myself in this new position Friday sitting on a box talking to this very big black lady with a gold tooth in front of her, her name is Liz, and, you know, I said, where did everything, what am I doing here, see? And then realizing as I continued into this, what a, what a change. And, and, but I didn't feel after a while that I had come down. I felt that I had gone up. I wasn't sitting in, in the oblivion of the mall of carpeting. And, you know, I was sitting on a box with this very fine lady. And, and, and she ended up, she says, you, it's very nice to meet you all. She says, one day you and me have lunch. I said, you Liz, you bring yours, I'll bring mine. And we'll... But, you know, I said, wow, what a, what a change. And to be able to say, you know, this indeed, I felt there was a, a sense of accomplishments and, and a sense of, of change that is, is, is moving within, that I trust to be the force of this meditation, the force of this power, the force of this intelligence that we call God. So everything is in control. It's like Lorraine said, whatever. When she moved into that period of being operated on for this, these teeth, that she concentrated, she brought herself into a oneness, and she sought that which came to her aid and carried her through it. This is exactly what, what's been going on with me and in, in the thing that I have had to go through. So cancer then, as we talked about, it, is a sign of transformation, compelling change, a compelling change from the old to the new. Yes? Sometimes that happened like right after our conversation. What conversation? With, like, noticing the people. Oh, yeah, well, that, the point was that where I had been in a real nice building before, and now I'm not in such a nice building, and I was a little bit uh, down about that, and I talked to Joan on the phone, and I said, you won't believe this place, you know. I'm used to, you know, sitting on hot seat furniture, and I was sitting on boxes, and Joan says, well, when the surroundings aren't that nice, you'll be more attentive to the people. And, and it was very true. The people were very nice, and the people more than anything made up for the absence of the more of carpeting. And sometimes when I see Liz with that gold tooth and her kindness and her understanding, how much more important is that than the more of carpeting that I used to bore myself with sitting and waiting for something to happen. Now something is happening. So, wow. So let's wrap this up. In the cancer, through its lunar astral quality, there is in cancer an intense inner sensitivity. Inside, there is a tremendous sensitivity. And it's difficult for me to even convey that to you other than to say it's true. But be forewarned that the, the cancer soul can be subject to such psychic stress and emotional strains so intense and inward as to be impossible to express outwardly. 
impossible to express outwardly, but yet it's there. It's, it's, it's the, it, is, it is surely a, a, a sign of emotion. And just like the crab that you saw on, on Rose's shirt, the crab tends to give way to timidity and fear and retreats into a hole. And the hole is ourself. I know that it's funny. Sometimes, Howard, I can reach out like the crab and bite, but other times just I don't want to hear it and just disappear. Sometimes a whole, I feel sometimes a whole lot could be accomplished if I would step up and say, hey. But instead, we fold our clothes and sneak back under the rock and hide and bury ourselves into the sand. And what cancer people must learn to do is love without the thought of return. Because it is the matter of growth into Christ that evokes the, the sovereign of heaven. And that brings the metamorphosis from self-centeredness to selflessness. Which cancer can be extremely self-centered, but through Christ can be extremely selfless. We're going to do Leo next. And uh, I don't know who, who, who is the lady behind the camera? Oh, I can't wait. I cannot wait for next week. Make sure that somebody else does the camera so that she sits right up front for that. All right? Oh, the lion roars, does she? Uh, yeah, well, we'll see. So thank you for sharing, we'll sh thank you for sharing the time with uh, myself and a few others here who experienced this sign of cancer. And before we turn it off, Craig, did you want to say something? Why don't you just uh, come up so. I think that um, what you found yourself and other cancer people may be able to. Come away from this light. Okay. I think this will throw us off. The way they may be able to view this, uh, the way to keep things in perspective, is that uh, for a cancer, it's a big ocean out there. And there's a lot of rocks, and there's a lot of currents. But it's a beautiful place, really, wherever you go. It just mm -hmm. depends how you look at it. And so, but there's no other fish in the sea, right, John? That's there. right. <laughs> That's interesting. He's got a good way of, uh, of putting putting words together, and uh, we want to use everybody's word. It is it is funny though, that I guess the basic tenets of what I learned about myself, uh, you know, the the digestive problem, which is part of the cancer trait, the inability to submit to authority and teachers and so forth, is part of the trait. Uh, the tendency to retreat back into the hole is, is part of the trait. And, uh, you know, it's, it's true. And I know it's, 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 been, it's part of my life. And yet also the great, uh, the great psychic type of feeling, the, the type of uh, deep involvement with spiritual things. We call it spirit psychic. You know, a lot of people are so dug on afraid of what word you use, you know. But when we're talking about that inner, inner change and that inner involvement of, of what goes on inside of you. It's, um, it, really is, it really is true. I would um, also suggest to all of you that as I try to pick and choose out of these things of Mr. Jocelyn, that when you get an opportunity to go into your bookstore, and I'm not selling this, we're not selling this at all, and Mr. Jocelyn is, is, is dead, that uh, you might want to spend time with this. So a lot of you know, horoscopes are just that, horrors. And I mean, to pick up those types of things and read them is, you know, it's just incredible nonsense. But to approach astrology from the scientific and scriptural basis and spiritual basis, um, I would strongly suggest this book called Meditation on the Signs of the Zodiac by John Jocelyn, whose name is spelled J-O-C-E-L-Y-N, I believe. And uh, a very good, mature approach from a, a Christian and spiritual perspective to the influences that the um, stars and planets have on our lives. As it says in Job 38, 21, can you bind the sweet influence of the Pleiades? <laughs> yes, you can. But you have to understand using the, the consciousness through meditation. Okay, thank you very, very much. And uh, we'll see you in just a bit. Bye-bye. Thank you so much for being with us tonight. Uh, we do appreciate you, and we appreciate your support. And uh, we just want to remind you that... Um, you know, with the video network, there are so many expenses. We have the cost of the tapes and mailing, et cetera. 
and you know how much postage is now. So we would appreciate it if you're not a monthly supporter, if you could possibly uh, be one. And, and if this would just like be a burden for you, then please, we don't want that. Um, we, we want you to feel free that these programs are you know, readily accessible to you. And if you can help support it financially, fine. If you can't, that's fine too. Uh, but if you do want to, if you would just let us know, um, you can let us know when you send your card back or you can give a call to area code 609-971-0537 and just say that you want to be part of the video network. Um, we also would like to remind you at this time if you could possibly mail the tape on as soon as you're done with it. Um, we just got back a tape the other day and it had been out for one whole year. So, and, and then you all get upset, you know, when you're on the route if you have to wait for your tape. So if we could just expedite it a little bit faster, that would be good. Um, <clears throat> Bill has uh, comprised a, a book, and it's called Answers, a book of biblical responses to questions concerning the teaching of Jesus Christ in the New Age. And uh, it deals with various topics of questions that you get asked, and, you know, you're sort of at a loss of, okay, what is my... What does the Bible say? How can I support this? So if you're interested in having this book, uh, if you would just send us a check for or money order for $7 stating that you would like this book, we would be most happy to get it right off to you. Uh, people in the church have been using it and they found it to be rather helpful. And it's how to deal with born again Christians and the different questions that they do ask you. So um, if you want one, again, just mail a check $7 to the Christian Village Church, and we would most certainly get it off to you. Thank you so much for being with us tonight, and we hope you, you will consider being a, a sponsor in, with the video network. It's good to see you back. The New Age Christian Village Church, and we just sit and talk about things. People think it's screwy or whatever. But uh, trying to make sense out of everything, biblically, ancient religions, the zodiac, all the stuff. You know, just, just, just talking about it. You don't have to believe anything. But it comes to you from the Christian Village Church, which is at 134 Route 9 in Forked River, next to Mrs. Walker's ice cream parlor. You know that the teachings of Jesus Christ are really amazing because once you get past him as a man and get to him as a part of you, something that lives inside of you, not a, not a man living inside of you, not another personality living inside of you, but you know the electrical signals inside of you that make things happen. All of these biblical names and words and places actually all symbolize different parts of the electrical circuitry in your brain that makes things happen. You know, people say, well, you know, we got very spiritual or the Holy Spirit came upon me and all this stuff. You, you absolutely cannot get spiritual unless something happens in the electrical circuitry of your brain. When you're operating quote unquote normally where you know we're at now your brain um, the cycles of the brain are going at I think 26 cycles per second and it's called um, beta when they move down to about 14 cycles per second you go into what is called alpha then you cross to the other side at about eight cycles per second and that's called theta and then when you go into that real, I mean, you know, it's like, you ever go to sleep, when you go to sleep and you woke up, and you're like, God, I died, no dreaming, no nothing, you just ceased to exist. That's called delta. And the brain waves have to change in order for this quote-unquote spiritual, this Holy Spirit experience actually is nothing more than a change in the cycles per second of the brain waves that move you from beta through alpha and then into theta. That's, it has to happen. There's no other way it can happen. Because if you stay in beta, your carnal mind is completely in charge, and there's nothing spiritual whatsoever that can come out of that. There's the understanding and so forth and so on. But that's what that's about. 
But when we talk about, you know, Jesus Christ, if we can get beyond him as a, as a human being, as a man, and really come to grips with what this name, Jesus Christ, what does it mean? Uh, in the Bible, in John 14, 20, he says, at that time, meaning today, you will know I am in the Father, you in me, and I in you. So that, that sets us where we should be looking if, we're, if we want to see Jesus Christ. There's two things. First of all, Jesus Christ said in Luke 17, 20, the kingdom does not come with observation. And in Luke 17, 21, he says, because it's within you. So we should not be looking outside. That's one of the real serious errors that Christianity makes. They're looking outside for a literal second coming. When the man, Jesus Christ himself, said, the kingdom does not come with observation. The kingdom is within you. And at that time, you will know I am in the Father, you in me, and I in you. So we have to be looking within ourselves. And Jesus said, you know, seek within yourself. And he said in Luke 11:52 that the reason that you don't have knowledge is because you take away the key of knowledge because you don't enter within yourself. So when, when we begin to understand that this Jesus Christ is actually a real aspect of our inner being that manifests as life within us and as wisdom and intelligence within us and get away from following a man because that's what he tried to do jesus christ did everything possible to get people to stop following him he said don't pray to him he says he wouldn't pray for you he said of his own self he could do nothing he said you could do what he did you could do better than he did he said you are the light of the world and yet religion has you down bowing and paying homage and asking jesus for this in john 16 23 jesus christ said don't ask me for nothing and yet religion says to pray to him. He says, don't pray to me. Religion says that uh, he'll intercede to the Father. He says, I won't pray to the Father for you. That's in John 16. You can find it yourself. Why? Because he's trying to get you to understand that everything is in here. It says that God lives in a temple not made with human hands. The only temple not made with human hands is in the side of your head. It's within you, and you have the ability, the authority, and the power to activate it. And once you do, there is no limit to you. There is no limit to what you can do. There is no limit to what you can accomplish. So, you know, let's, let's, let's think about this. It says in Matthew 26, 14, one of the twelve, Judas Iscariot, one of the twelve. Why was there twelve? You know, you, you, you shouldn't read up one of the twelve. Why was there twelve? Because there's twelve signs of the zodiac. That's why there was twelve. That's where it came from. The twelve disciples, the twelve apostles, the twelve tribes all come from the fact of the twelve signs of the zodiac, which is called in Job 38:32, Maseroth. It says, can you bring forth Maseroth? That's the 12 signs of the zodiac. And Judas is represented as the eighth sign, Scorpio. In fact, when I guess it was Michelangelo painted the Last Supper, he was an astrologer. Did you know that Michelangelo was an astrologer? He was. Anyhow, when he painted the Last Supper, he painted Christ, which is the sun, surrounded by the 12, which is the signs of the zodiac, and Judas was portrayed as the eighth from the left, which is Scorpio. And Scorpio is the sign in the sky. I've told you repeatedly that the Bible was written in the stars long before it was ever written on a book or in a piece of paper. But Scorpio is the sign in which the story unfolds of the Savior triumphing, triumphing over the age-old serpent. And if you look at that sign, you got to get, a, get an astrology book. The heck with what religion tells you. Just get it. Get an astrology book and look at the sign. You'll see the scorpion is trying to sting the heel of the man. But at the same time, the man is bruising the head of the adversary. In Genesis 3.15, it says, Talking to the adversary, it, the man, shall bruise your head. You shall bruise his heel. This is the conflict that's taking place in this 
crucifixion business with 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 with, uh, with uh, uh, Judas, etc., and and Jesus getting crucified and all that. That's the conflict. You know, there's a big when when you read in the Bible. I've got a picture around here somewhere. I'll show it to you in a couple weeks. But when you read in the Bible, it says, "You shall bruise. Uh, he shall bruise your head, but you shall bruise his heel." There's a picture of uh, Hare Krishna wrestling with the serpent, and he's got his foot on the serpent's head. It, it's the same thing, because all of this stuff comes out of astrology. It, it doesn't make any difference whether religion likes it or not. Who cares? I mean, what have we accomplished with that? It's, it's a fact. But th it's the truth that all of this stuff comes out of the stars. What's interesting here is when you, when you read the Bible story, where does, where does Judas go to get his allies to drive this, you know, to get rid of this Christ? Where does he go? He goes to the religious. He goes to the chief priests. There is an aspect in you and in me that will drive this inner Christ out of us. So it can never do us any good, and that's religion. You know, you, you gotta, you, you've got you to gotta think about something here. Judas was trusted by Jesus. You know, we always hear that Judas betrayed Jesus. Let me tell you something. Why didn't Jesus, when he was asked at the Last Supper, who is it that's going to betray you? Why didn't he point over and say, that guy over there, that's Judas. That no good scoundrel, he's going to do it. He didn't say that. Instead, Jesus said, the one to whom I dip the sop. He's the guy. Once you see that, you should really stop there. Religion never, you know, your Bible studies never do that. You shouldn't, it, uh, you should not go to a Bible study if anybody takes it literally anyhow. But the second thing is, if they, if, you shouldn't go to a Bible study unless somebody has a dictionary there. Because when you read in the Bible that Jesus says, the one to whom I dipped the sop, he's the one, you should look up the word sop, S-O-P, in the dictionary. And you know what sop, sop is? Well, you, you know, you dip the bread in the gravy, but it has another meaning. It has an ancient meaning, and that's what Jesus was using. It means getting a favor from somebody who is trusted and in authority. Jesus trusted Judas. That's why Judas was the secretary of the disciples. He controlled the box. Jesus wanted Judas to do him a favor. So when Judas is going running out of there, he doesn't think he's doing anything bad at all because he's the one who was selected by Jesus. Do me a favor. Go ahead and do this. So Judas is running out thinking, hey, man, wow, he wants me to do this. I'll tell him where he is, and then he's going to bring down his power and blow the lid off of this place because Judas didn't understand the nature of the kingdom. He thought in the same way like religion. Religion thinks exactly like Judas. Judas thought that there was going to be a kingdom that, you know, like a... Like a, 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 like a political kingdom. And that's what Christianity thinks. They're waiting for Jesus to come back and set up his kingdom. It, Jesus said, my kingdom is not of this world. It's a, it's a mystical kingdom of consciousness. It happens in here. Because when your consciousness changes through meditation to become Christ-like, then with millions of people become Christ-like, then the kingdom starts to affect the outside because it was originated on the inside. But that's an interesting thing, isn't it? Jesus said, the guy that I give the sop, and when you look up the word sop in the dictionary, it means getting a favor from somebody in a trusted position. So here then, Judas goes running out, figuring, wow, I'm going to do a favor. I'm going to spring this kingdom here on earth. He, he wasn't against Jesus, obviously, because when he found out that this deal went sour, what did he do? He, he hung himself, and he threw everything down. So. But let me, let me think of something here. It was the chief priests and the elders, according to the Bible, it was the re chief priests and the re elders who were trying to kill the Christ out. And what were they mad at him about? They weren't mad because he was forming a new religion. They could care less. They were mad at him because he was getting people away from organized religion. Jesus Christ was saying to people, the kingdom of God is within you. You don't need this organized religious business. He became a threat to the system. 
and he was starting to hit them in their pocketbook. And therefore, the chief priests and the elders, the religious people, had to do him in. But there's an interesting point about that. And the interesting point is that according to the Bible, it was God's will that Jesus die. So then Judas and all of these people that did the terrible thing and all of the soldiers that nailed him to the cross, they were the ones who were doing the will of God. They were the good guys. Because if anybody had stopped that, God's will couldn't have been fulfilled. So what the heck is this all about? Is this, does this mean that there's a God somewhere that can't get his ego satisfied unless he slaughters this young 30-year-old guy and the blood and all the gore is dripping all over the place? Then he sits up on his planet somewhere and says, okay, I'm happy now. This is nice. I like this. Boy, that was quite a show. That's ridiculous. What does it all mean? It means that the absolute essential part of your life can be fulfilled only when the Jesus part, which represents the flesh, is killed so that the Christ part, which represents the higher mind, can live. And who is it that will kill the Jesus part of you dead? Religion. You know why? Because they'll have you so guilty they'll have you so filled with fear and guilt and remorse that you'll finally get to the point that you'll give it all up and say, I can't stand this anymore. You'll go to church, but you'll still come back and say, man, I, what is this world? What is my life? It's a mess. And then it will bring you to the point where Jesus wanted you to be and what this story of Jesus' crucifixion is all about. You will kill the five senses. The five senses are the five wounds that Jesus took, hands, feet, and sight. The five senses are sight, taste, touch, smell, hearing. You'll kill those out in meditation. The Jesus part will die, and the Christ part will rise up in the higher consciousness to live. That's what all of this is about. That's why it's important, and that's the purpose that religion really serves, is Finally, that people get so deeply discouraged with themselves and with life that they throw it all away and find within themselves that true kingdom where Christ dwells inside of them. I wanted to tell you, and if you get a piece of paper, I'll tell you where you can get in touch with us, okay? We have a Hidden Meanings TV network, and each month we send out a VCR tape, and it has... Uh, the services from the church in Fork and River. And all we ask you to do is pass it on to the next person whose name we give you. It does not cost you any money. But uh, if, you would, if you would consider that, I'll give you a phone number where you can call right now and you just say, hey, I want to be on the uh, TV network. This is the phone number. The phone number, if I can, there'll be an answering machine which will answer it. The phone number is Area code 609-971-0537. Area code 609-971-0537. And just over the machine say, I want to be on the TV network and we'll get you on. Okay? You know what it says in the Bible? That when Judas went to the high priest, and, and, and once again, this gets acted out in the, in the Zodiac and astrology. They said they covenanted with him for 30 pieces of silver. That's where the drama really begins. In Zechariah 11, 12, it says, give me my price. So they weighed for my price 30 pieces of silver. The 30 pieces of silver is, and I'll tell you exactly what this is. In each sign of the Zodiac are 30 degrees. There are three signs, three lower signs of 10 degrees each. So you have 30 degrees, you have 12 signs, which is the 360 degrees. The 30 pieces of silver actually are the 30 degrees of the constellation Scorpio. See, silver is aligned with the moon, which is consciousness. And it's actually silver is the subconscious. Thus, this scripture takes the 30 pieces of silver to the zodiac as it applies to the human mind. And you'd have to look at those three decons or the 30 degrees of um, Scorpio. And what they are, they are serpents, 
Opiochus and Hercules. Say, Opiochus is the man. You'll see that if you look at the astrological sign. He's the man. He's, the, he's depicted as a great struggle with the serpent. And, and, and what you'll see if you look at Scorpio, you'll see Ophiuchus struggling with the serpent, and the serpent's head is reaching up. The head of the serpent is reaching up, trying to grab. You know what the serpent's trying to grab? The crown. And that's why it says in Revelation 3.11, let no man take your crown. So the lower impulse, in other words, the lower mind is trying to steal the relationship that God activates in the higher mind. And so the man, and in this particular case of religion, Jesus, is trying to prevent that. Okay. See, what I would show you now, we'll take a look at now, is the, the obvious connection between Jesus as the Christ in the Bible and Ophiuchus as the man struggling with the serpent in the zodiac of astrology. And why this 30 pieces of silver is part of this Judas Scorpio drama. Ophiochus, the star deacon that I'm talking about, the man struggling with the serpent, you know, in the, in, the, in the stars, is identified in Greek mythology with tough name Asclepius, the son of Apollo. Now, don't let all these names run you over, but, but he becomes the son of God. And the myth is that he restored Hippolytus to life and was hailed as the great physician. So this Ophiochus is also hailed as the great physician in the same way that Jesus was hailed as the, as the, as the great physician. Well, Pluto, who is the god of the underworld, was upset about this healing. So he had Jupiter come along and kill Asclepius. But after he died, God, who was Apollo, raised Asclepius up to heaven. Now, I want you to listen very closely. What I am going, you're, when I tell you about how Christianity copies from the ancient myths and from the astrology and all this stuff, listen to this hymn of Asclepius, which is the same as Ophiochus, excuse me, all these words, um, which is from the Zodiac. Now listen to the hymn. Hail, great physician of the world, all hail, mighty infant, who in years to come shall heal the nations and defraud the tomb. Swift be thy growth. They triumph unconfined, make kingdoms thicker and increase mankind. Thy daring art shall animate the dead and draw the thunder on thy guilty head. For you shall die, but from the dark abode rise up victorious and, victorious and be twice a god. That is a quote-unquote pagan hymn which actually not only writes out the, the death and resurrection of Oscalopius, but that which was Jesus Christ. All of this stuff, all of this stuff was copied from the ancient myths and from the, from the stars and the zodiac, etc. But here when we had uh, Judas giving off those 30 pieces of silver, you have to understand, remember, that silver means, means consciousness. It means consciousness. And so uh, the, the misunderstanding or failure to stay the course is identified with the mind, the emotions, which is silver. So all of these things have a very, very important part to play. They play deeply into the drama, the zodiacal drama, the drama of the ancient religions, and so forth and so on. But, you know, it's, it's hard to consider Judas as a betrayer because, as it says in the Bible, Jesus identified him as the one to whom he would pass the sop, which means you're asking a favor. Well, you can't very well be betrayed when you know in advance that you're being betrayed, or that when you ask a person to go out and do it, you're not very well being betrayed, are you? We so miss these obvious uh, connections with the ancient things and with the stars. It's really interesting. I, I've done a series uh, called The Zodiac in the Bible, and when you look at the stars and what they mean, for instance, there's one star in the constellation Ursa Major, uh, which is called the Daughters of the Assembly, and in the, the other star in that constellation is called Talitha. Well, uh, if you remember in the Bible, one of the rulers of the synagogue comes to Jesus, and that was called the Assembly, and he says, my daughter is dying. So there you have the star of the Daughters of the Assembly. So Jesus goes over and heals the guy's daughter, and guess what her name is? Talitha. There's two stars in a constellation that find their way into a Bible. They become a Bible story 
but the people that teach the Bible have no idea that those stars are in the sky and they are part of the zodiac and part of the astrological science of the universe of which the Bible was written. And you can't, you know, I know people get very upset you tell them these things, but why not, why should the truth hurt anybody? Why, why, you know, I, I was going to a couple weeks ago do a little quiz. Maybe I've got two minutes, maybe I can get this quiz in, okay? First of all, here's the question one. Jesus said, unto you is given to know the mysteries of the kingdom, but unto them it is not given. Do you know the mysteries of the kingdom? And if not, why not? That's Matthew 13, 11. Jesus says, unto you is given to know the mysteries of the kingdom. Okay? The second thing, Matthew 6, 22, Jesus says, if your eye be single, your body will fill with light. Have you ever practiced the deep metaphysical aspect of meditation called the single eye? If not, why not? If Jesus said do it, shouldn't you do it? Even if religion says don't do it, if Jesus said to do it, shouldn't you do it? Question number three, Jesus says the kingdom of God is within you, and in Matthew 6, 33, he said you should seek that first. Have you ever looked inside of yourself for the kingdom? And if not, why not? If he said it. And in question four, Paul... Thank you so much for being with us today. Um, we really do appreciate all of you in Manhattan. Um, you just flow with the message that Bill delivers. And uh, there's just a few things that I want to inform you about. Number one, we do have an information uh, booklet uh, about our church. So if you are interested, just call area code 609-971-0537 and state that you would like the information packet about our church and we'd be most happy to mail it to you. And we also do have what's called a video network and the way it operates is, is that uh, we videotape the church services and remember we are a new age church and uh, so you will be receiving teachers about Buddha, Krishna, Jesus, uh, everything that applies to your life. And uh, the way the video network operates is that we would mail you a videotape once a month, and your only obligation is to mail it on to the next person. So uh, if you would like to see Bill more often than the weekly uh, Manhattan ca uh, TV cable, then just uh, give a call now to area code 609-971-0537 and state that you would like to be on the video network. Remember, your only obligation is to mail this videotape on to the next person. The uh, next thing that we do have is there's an excellent book if you're learning how to meditate or if you've been meditating for a while and you just want to see if there are other techniques that could possibly help you and it's called the new three-minute meditator and it's written by David Harp it's written with a lot of humor and it's probably the it's the best book that I have ever read on um, techniques as far as meditating so if you would like this book send a check for 995 to the New Age Christian Village Church P.O. Box 569, Forkett River, New Jersey, 08731, and uh, we would be most happy to mail the book to you. We also have a booklet, and this would help you in answering questions that born-again Christians will uh, ask you. Uh, as you know, they will come at you with the literal translation of the Bible, and uh, Bill has addressed many of the common questions and uh, this booklet will help you in answering these questions. So the price of it is $7, and if you're interested, just mail a check to, again, the New Age Christian Village Church, P.O. Box 569, Forkett River, New Jersey, 08731. State